Hello. Okay. Right. We'll start the last session of the day. We've got four talks in fairly quick succession, <laughs> which will be fun. And first up is Thomas. Thank you. Thank you. We are even starting slightly earlier. So, ah, here's, here's the display. Okay. I'm old school kernel hacker. Um, my last commit in the official kernel is from 1996, I think, or seven. I'm, I'm not sure. It was the de-entry cache. And afterwards, I did some other work, and now I'm working at one and one intranet, uh, the biggest intranet provider in Europe, together with some further companies belonging to the same group. And there, I'm responsible for a kernel, customized kernel, with lots of own patches and then later rolled out to about 20,000 servers. Just what I'm working. So I'm working at operations. Although I'm a developer, I'm working at operations. And today I want uh, to introduce you to software I was working several years for. I'm working for several years now. It's similar to DRBD. If you know DRBD, then you will immediately grasp what Mars is. As Mars is uh, the sister of DRBD. It's just working asynchronously. And I want to explain you today what you can do with it, just using it in an unconventional way. Well, I'm first talking about storage architecture. Does it work here, my pointer? Well, I cannot see. Here is it. Stor storage architecture. And this is influencing the costs I want to talk about. So uh, by choosing the architecture, you will have different costs and also different reliability. So this is the main thing of the presentation. Next point is a sysadmin step-by-step -step instruction, how to do it, how to do background migration via Mars from logical volumes from one host to another one. It's very simple. And then I'll focus on some use cases because many people have been probably misguided by some claims about what is best. And I want to clarify or contribute to the discussion here. Reliability is a similar issue. I will just go into that and then afterwards some details if you have time. Okay. First looking at this architecture you probably already know. The so-called big cluster. That means you have different nodes for compute here, the front ends, and you have storage server for back ends. And in our case of one and one you have about nine million home directories. Each of these users is a different home directory. And you can see different user means already partitioned data because these are, have to be isolated from each other. And uh, in this case, uh, each front end could potentially serve each of these home directories via load balancer. You can imagine what it would mean here. And you have an internal storage network that the critical point here is each of the front end servers can at least potentially talk to any of the storage servers. And that means an O of N square communication overhead, at least for keeping the TCP uh, connections alive, at least for that. And this means you probably have some problems with scalability because it's a full mesh, it's like a crossbar here. So the next alternative, the next slide is, we have it, yes. Sharding, you probably also know. The idea is having a self-contained machine where everything is in one box, from the storage up to whatever you are needing, up, up to the up, uplink here. And that means if one of these things here fail, the other ones are not affected. You have no cross traffic between them, except, and that's the point, if you have geo-redundancy as we have, it's one of our biggest features, you have a small, a relatively small replication network, and this can be also used for batch migration in the background. And the idea is that you can even have traffic shaping if you are using Mars. With the RBD, you have more real-time traffic there. But with Mars, you can do even traffic shaping there and um, use the, just the bandwidth which otherwise would be unused. So scalability is clear. This model scales really. Because if it does not scale, then the internet will not scale. So, it's equivalent to scalability of the internet as such. So, 
let's look at the method, how background migration is done via mouse. Precondition is we have a host A, where some VM is running, and running all the time. We have to minimize the downtime. Host B has some spare space. And I'm also assuming that already member of the same mouse cluster. Yeah? Mouse clusters, you have new operations like join cluster or merge cluster. And um, you're just creating a new logical volume at LVM level with the same size as the old, uh, the existing copy. And then have only one command, mass RDM, join resource, name of the resource, and the freshly created volume group, uh, logical volume. And then background migration starts. Uh, it varies from a few minutes to several days, depending on the size and on your uplink. For example, our database server, where it's also used, uh, have only 50 or 60 gigs for several thousands of MySQL machines. And this is a matter of minutes or of half an hour in worst case, whatever it is. And in other cases of some very old machines where we have 40 terabyte with only one gig uplink, it takes up to one week. And uh, here, the real thing, what you need to think about is the machine is altering the data all the time. And during that, while the data is being modified, it's migrated in the background. And <clears throat> either via Mars or via DRBD in this concept. So and, uh, you wait for status up to date in the Mars Adim view command. And then you can switch over, just you stop the machine here. You say mouse RDM primary, similar to DRBD. If you are used to DRBD, you know what it means. And then start the machine at the other, at the new host. And then you can get rid of the old resource um, by just leaving the resource, the mouse cluster, and then LV remove, get rid of the data. And afterwards, you can, for example, if you do it with all of the uh, logical volumes, you can decommission it for hardware lifecycle or whatever you want to do with it. So, use cases is something I want to do shortly because this discussion here is now a little bit, uh, a big cluster architecture is marketed by, uh, by, some, by, by some guys as can do everything. And I don't, uh, no, I know that it's not true because we have several such clusters in our company and not all of them are scaling as they should be, as expected. In two dimensions, in the dimension of scalability, performance, and the other one, reliability. And the reasons are probably that uh, if you try to put some file system on top of object stores, which are spreading the objects over many, many servers, then essentially you are doing the same as a RAID 10, similar to RAID 10, over thousands or ten thousands of disks, would you do that in practice? No, you would create multiple RAID sets, even with RAID 10. And that's the point here. So just don't do that. And the other cases, um, you can look up uh, after my presentation. About reliability. The red ones are node failures. Oh, my pointer doesn't work. No, it's Okay, here you have one red one and the other one. With Mars or DRBD, the probability to hit the same pair, you have these classical pairs. In our case, it's geo-redundant. The one row is in the one data center, the other row is in the other one. And hitting exactly the same pair by accident is very low probability. It can happen, but I've seen it only once in 10 years in our installation. With a big cluster architecture, and the same redundancy degree, it means two replica, hitting any two machines is much easier. Downtime of two machines. Then you have an incident, and some of the marketing guys say that the size of the incident matters. I don't believe this. Because if you have a file system, classical file system like XFS, and only one per mil of your data is I.O. error, what do you do then? You have to file system check, run file system check. And that's the problem. So um, depending on whether you are arguing with the size of the incident, 
you, you can get, uh, come to different results, different conclusions here. My guess is this is the simplest architecture and even the, the low cost, of course, because um, this uh, sharding architecture, you don't have a replication um, a storage network at all. And you just are halving the number of servers there. Here's another example where you can uh, get geo-redundancy even cheaper. Here the idea is that you partition your primary sites. The boldface are the primaries and the secondaries are, are here. You have three data centers and here the model is one data center out of those three may fail. So you have, can have further savings. So you are commissioning only the CPU power for these primaries and ordinarily you will compensate only the failure of one of three. So if you look at the calculations, it's even cheaper. You have only a factor of 1.5 overhead. But the problem here is you may need a more flexible CPU assignment. And this is on the next slide. So here, for example, we have a hypervisor normally running three virtual machines. Uh, in our case, it's LXC containers. And assume that memory is not enough. You have a memory problem. Now, <clears throat> what do you do? They are running locally, ordinarily, and exceptionally, you are just creating an iSCSI or the future Mars remote device, a new feature in Mars, a future feature for exporting this block device here to another hypervisor where you have lots of RAM and capacity, and there you are running for a while. So this is just for, for a short-time incident or for a short-time problem. For a long time, you will start the replication here that means you are creating, in, uh, uh, in parallel to this um, real-time connection here, a background migration, as shown in some slides ago. So you have an additional copy here. You can dynamically create any number of replicas as long as you have storage. That's the basic idea. Dynamically increase the number of replicas. So if you had two replicas before, now you are creating two additional ones for example, and migrate here. And the last slide, the next slide, I did not, you can imagine what it means. You just switch over the primary here, and then afterwards you can, for example, decommission the older whatever you are needing here. What's your use case, depending on the use case. So this is it already. In principle, current status of Mars. It's GPL, it's a kernel module, it's on GitHub. Uh, you need some, at the moment, you need some, you need to have um, a pre-patch. So you need to compile your own kernel at the moment. There's already one version in testing without needing a pre-patch. So DKMS can be used, but not, but only for some old kernels at the moment. I'm working for improving that. There's a manual with step-by-step -step instructions for sysadmins. So you hopefully should be able to use it. Uh, it's productive since a few years. It's the backbone of the geo-redundancy feature we are publicly advertising. It has millions of operation hours. I've start, I stopped counting after 30 millions. So I don't know it anymore. It doesn't make any difference. It runs on a few thousands of machines. The total storage space is about uh, two times 12 petabytes, but this is only the, the physical storage. The logical, of course, is much smaller. What's interesting for you is the number of inodes, because uh, if you have nine millions of home directories, uh, there are, most of the files are extremely small. And uh, the file distribution is something interesting. It's an exponential distribution, ZIPS law. Only a very few number of customers have extremely huge files and using up to two terabyte each. And that means uh, only for the special cases, we need some machines which have, uh, for example, 300 terabytes physical on eight, 48 spindles. And then use, uh, we have 10 LXC containers on, on them, each having 30 terabytes for the so-called quota customers, but the exceptional ones. And current project, this admins are now playing um, container football. So if the container is at the wrong location, just kick it to somewhere else. And they have started to do this with a script uh, called tetris.shell. It's on, already on GitHub in the contrib directory. You can look at it. 
So this is the currently ongoing thing and a future thing here will be that um, new versions which uh, will be able to uh, mass scale, so it means many thousands of machines, but only at metadata level. So it will be a big cluster, but not at the data path, only at the metadata path. So last slide. Three layers here. I think physical layer is, we have replaced originally we had DRBD. It's done a few years ago. Current status is we are creating virtual uh, storage pools like LVM, but virtually spread over thousands of machines. And this Tetris.shell is already doing this by hand. So you, you start a migration by hand. And it's using the, our internal proprietary cluster manager CM3. And I'm currently working on making something work with systemd and uh, probably a libvirt plugin. I have also a prototype of that. What's really missing at the moment is an automatic load balancing framework or something like. And there I would like to get some feedback from you. Uh, some ideas are implementing at libvirt level or with OpenStack. I also looked at Kubernetes, but I'm not sure whether the model will fit uh, because it's uh, probably intended for something else for these con containers. Okay, so we have one minute left for discussion, or two minutes. Time for one question. No? Okay, thank you very much.